Let's pray. Father, as we come today, I pray that you would reorient our priorities today. I pray that you would remind us today that where you dwell is lovelier than any other place that we could be. That it is not our homes, it is not our our land, it is not the things that we can create with ourselves that are beautiful and wonderful. It is dwelling with you. And I pray that today, here on a Sunday morning, we would be reminded of that, that we would be called to to come to a sweeter and better place than the places that we can make for ourselves. God, I know that we are tempted to try to build kingdoms, to build refuges, to build safe places for ourselves here. But I pray that the songs that we sing and the words that are read and the, the words that we hear would call to us and say, come up to a beautiful and better place. May our hearts not settle for what we can buy or what we can earn. What the world tells us will be a safe and beautiful and perfect place. God, I pray that today our hearts would hear the truth, that it is your dwelling place that is lovely and is good. God, I pray today, no matter what roads those who are here would be, are walking, God, I pray that you today would give us a deeper and deeper hunger for you, not just for our problems to be solved. When our, God, we, we know what it's like to be afraid, to be in despair about the future. We know what it's like to doubt. We, God, we walk all sorts of roads with all sorts of temptations. And I pray today that you would give us a deeper hunger for you not just a hunger for our problems to be solved. God, I pray, you, your word says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And so I pray today that we would be hungrier and thirstier at the end of the day than we start right now. God, I pray today for those in our church who are afraid and who struggle with fear. God, I pray that you would Remind them that you are the God who saves. And so our courage comes not from ourselves, but from you. God, I pray that you would calm their fears, those that are here and that are afraid. Those that are not with us, but are at home or in the hospital today and are afraid of what the future holds. They're afraid of what's going to happen. I pray, God, that you would take away fear and replace it with peace. God, I pray for those that come here with doubts today. Doubts about you, doubts about your plan, doubts about the the fact that you even exist, doubts that you will forgive, doubts that you will receive them. God, I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would use your words to create in us deep conviction of the goodness and the reality of God and of the reality of his love and acceptance for us. God, I pray for those who are struggling with despair and depression today. And it was hard to get out of bed again this morning. I pray, God, that you would surround them with your love. That you would use the good news of the gospel. That it is not our behavior that makes us acceptable. I pray that you would use that to dispel the darkness that wants to crowd in. God, I pray for those that are angry and bitter today. I pray that you would use the story of the cross to define our lives and dispel our anger and bitterness towards others or our anger and bitterness towards you. I pray that the gospel would be the story that, that changes our hearts. God, I pray today for our brothers and sisters in Winchester who are gathering in churches today to worship you, to hear from your word. I pray, we, I pray today that you would be honored and worshiped today in Winchester. I pray that in those churches, like in ours, they would be hungrier for you so that they can be filled God, I pray that you would strengthen them with your word, that their conviction would be that the Holy Spirit uses the word to grow your people, and that they would trust in that, that they wouldn't trust themselves to people or strategies or things. And I pray, God, that their witness would grow in Winchester, that those who have never heard of the great love of God would get to hear it and experience it through the churches that are there. God, I pray today for the Four Corners Home for Children that we're, that we're supporting in Arizona. God, your word says that you are the father to the fatherless. And so I pray that through that ministry, Lord, that you would be demonstrating your great love to the fatherless there in Arizona. 
Pray that you would show yourself to be a defender of the widows and defender of those who have nowhere else to turn through their ministry. God, I pray that you would protect them, that you would give integrity to the leadership there, that you would show them your love through providing all of their finances, providing the the volunteers and the workers that they need for their ministry. And I pray that one child at a time, you would be demonstrating to the world that God doesn't overlook anybody. Pray all of these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. Earlier this summer, I took my kids to the zoo again, and we kind of try to take a few trips a year down to St. Louis. And we always have to stop at the gorilla enclosure. That's Sometimes the days are just too hot. There's just not enough time to see everything. And so... Uh, this was one of those days where we're like, okay, what do we have to see? And so we made sure to go by and see the gorillas. And if you haven't been there or haven't been there recently, it's a great exhibit, a group of bachelor gorillas. Um, And there's usually a few of them that are out, and they have both an inside and an outside enclosure. And the outside has um, like 20-foot rock walls built around it, so it kind of looks like you're looking down into a forest glen, I don't actually know what Glenn means, but it sounds like the right word you would use there. Uh, <laughs> uh, like into this little forest area, and you like surrounded by these big, huge rocks and a moat. And so we're looking at the gorillas. We love it. We talk about it. Emma and I can't really avoid looking at the gorillas without mentioning the one from seven or eight years ago that got killed when a little boy was you know, wandered into the enclosure. Maybe you remember that. So she and I are kind of making, you know, talking about that and still going, how? It wasn't a St. Louis. It was at a different zoo. But how in the world does a child get into a gorilla enclosure? And we come around the corner, and I discover how this happens. Because this boy comes out of a doorway, it's about 10 or 11 years old, and starts climbing the boulders that go into the gorilla enclosure. And I'm usually like a live and let live. I'm not going to interfere with somebody else's kid. But I couldn't stop myself and was like, hey, you, get down. And the boy like gets down and like looks at me like, what's your problem? And, and I was like, does he realize if he fell over that, what he was climbing on, he would fall 20 feet into a group of gorillas and we'd have no idea what would happen. The woman that was maybe the mom or friend or whoever was with this group kind of also looked at me like, that's strange. And I was like, well, okay. So I discovered that day that at first I thought, this boy doesn't care, he's a daredevil. And the more I think about it, the more I realize that boy didn't, may not have actually known what enclosure he was looking at. Because the angle that we came at it, and he came out, the do- out of the door, there was no view of what was on the other side of the boulders. This was the spot where there no, were, were no windows, there were no cutouts, there was no sign saying, stay off of these rocks, there's gorillas on the other side. But the reality is there was. And in this, the boy doesn't know the danger, but it doesn't really matter that he knows the danger or not. There is a danger on the other side of this, not only falling 20 feet, but end up landing inside a group of gorillas. We have no idea what they would do if a 10-year-old boy landed in the middle of them. I was thinking of that story this week because you and I go through life and sometimes we know the dangers that are out there and sometimes we don't know the dangers that are out there. Sometimes we find ourselves like that boy climbing a, a series of boulders, not thinking and wondering, I wonder what's on the other side of this. We find ourselves in a situation and we miss and just don't understand. There's a big danger on the other side of this. I wonder how many of us are here today and we have no real idea of what the danger that's on the other side of what we're dealing with is. We think we know. I want to do this. I want to go there. I want to be with this person. You know, I feel this way, and so I think I should act this way. I wonder how many of us come here on Sunday morning and don't know the danger that's out there. Go ahead and turn with me to Zephaniah chapter 2. And it's okay to use your index. Zephaniah is a three-page book at the end of the Old Testament, so it is certainly okay to look at your index to make sure that you don't miss it. Zephaniah is a short book written just before Judah goes into exile. 
one of the last messages that God gives them before they go into exile. The story of the Bible continues. It's not the end because the Lord brings the people of Israel or the people of Judah out of exile back into the land. And then eventually we know Jesus himself comes. But Zephaniah is this short book where a, a member of the king's family speaking for God, comes and says, you do not know the danger that's out there. You think you know what life is like. You think you know the road that you should go. You think you know what you should do, but you don't. So Zephaniah chapter 2. Today we're going to be looking at verses 4 to 15. Zephaniah chapter 2, starting in verse 4. And this speaks to this section that we're going to be dealing with today, sorry, is going to be speaking to the people surrounding Judah. There kind of goes counterclockwise around the people of Judah, speaking to them and saying, You don't know what you're doing. Beginning in verse 4 Gaza will be abandoned and Ashkelon left in ruins. At midday, Ashdod will be emptied and Ekron uprooted. Woe to you who live by the sea, you Carathite people. The word of the Lord is against you, Canaan, land of the Philistines. He says, I will destroy you and none will be left. The land by the sea will become pastures, having wells for shepherds and pens for flocks. That land will belong to the remnant of the people of Judah. There they will find pasture. In the evening they will lie down in the houses of Ashkelon. The Lord their God will care for them. He will restore their fortunes. Verse 8, I have heard the insults of Moab and the taunts of the Ammonites who insulted my people and made threats against their land. Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, surely Moab will become like Sodom, the Ammonites like Gomorrah, a place of weeds and salt pits, a wasteland forever. The remnant of my people will plunder them. The survivors of my nation will inherit their land. This is what they will get in return for their pride, for insulting and mocking the people of the Lord Almighty. The Lord will be awesome to them when He destroys all the gods of the earth. Distant nations will bow down to Him. All of them in their own lands. Verse 12, You Cushites too will be slain by my sword. He will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, leaving Nineveh utterly desolate and dry as the desert. Flocks and herds will lie down there, creatures of every kind. The desert owl and the screech owl will roost on her columns. Their hooting will echo through the windows. Rubble will fill the doorways. The beams of cedar will be exposed. This is the city of revelry that lived in safety. She said to herself, I am the one and there is none besides me. What a ruin she has become, a lair for wild beasts. All who pass by her scoff and shake their fists. Let's pray. God, as we open your word today, help us to hear your warning to us. Help us to take seriously the sin that lives in us and threatens us day by day. In Jesus' name, amen. Here in chapter 2, Zephaniah comes and calls to the nations around Israel and calls to you and I and says, bow before the awesome Lord before it's too late. says, bow before the awesome Lord before it's too late. And what I want to show you today in these verses is three ways that God calls us to bow before Him. Three ways that God calls us to bow before Him. First way is to pursue humility. Throughout these condemnations, I said that it kind of works counterclockwise around the people of Israel. In between Judah and the sea, if you can imagine on a map, there was, it's where the Philistines lived, it's Gaza, it's this first section, and he's condemning them and saying, God's judgment is going to come on you. Then he moves down to kind of the southwest, uh, southeast of Israel, to Moab and Amnon, uh, Amnon. Ammon, that is, uh, that is the descendants of Lot, and says, 
Judgment is coming, Lot. Moves even further and says the Cushites. That's not a word we would ever use. That's Ethiopia. At the time, Ethiopia was ruling Egypt. And so he's calling out and saying, Ethiopia, you, like, hear the warning. And then he moves up to, maybe you remember Nineveh from the story of Jonah. Nineveh is the capital city of Assyria. And he says, just because you're mighty now doesn't mean you always will be. And so he calls to each of them and, the, and calls them to repent. But what I want you to notice in these verses is why these people are called to repent. The first reason he calls them to repent in this pursued humility is he says that their root sin is a sin of pride. They have raised themselves up, not just against the people around them, but that they've raised themselves up against God. Verse 10 says, this is what they will get in return for their pride. Verse 15, this is the city of revelry that lived in safety. She said to herself, I am the one and there is none besides me. This is a phrase that only God can actually say. And it's put into the mouth of the the kingdom of Assyria that says, look at me. I am self-sufficient. I am sovereign. I can take care of myself. There is nobody like me. The root sin in in these verses of the nations surrounding Judah is the sin of pride. If God made you profit for a day, and said, speak to the nation of the United States of America. Speak to England. Speak to China. Speak to India. Speak to the nation. My guess is you would probably have a list of sins that you would say, repent. This is what God says. Here are the big sins. But if you're like me, the one that comes to mind first is not pride. We, would, we might come up with all sorts of lists of saying, guys, repent of your sin. Don't go that way. You have your list. All of us kind of tend to have our, our own list. But when the Bible comes and says, repent, one of the most frequent things God says is, turn from your pride. Because I believe pride is at the root of almost all of our other sins. We set ourselves up and say, I and the one, and there is none besides me. And so I will sin to get what I want in my home. I am, there is, I am the one, and there is none besides me. So it is okay if I do that thing again, because that's what I want. Pride is at the root of so many of our sins, and God comes and says, that is a danger that you have no idea where it leads. You have no idea what is coming. We live in an age that exalts, exalts pride. It holds it up and says, you just need to be more confident in yourself. You just need to look at yourself and trust in yourself. It's hard to buy kids' clothes that don't say, I am the best. Right, parents or grandparents? It's hard to buy some clothes for a little boy that doesn't say, just watch me. And God says, you have no idea the disaster that comes with that. The advice that we give ourselves or the people around us so often has to do with trusting ourselves, providing for ourselves, looking out for ourselves, and God says, no, humility is safety, not pride. Pride is the great danger to the nations that are around Judah. And so when God sends a prophet, the prophet comes and says, this is what they will get in return for their pride. So it's a call to you and I to pursue humility and say, if pride gets judgment, God, I want to be humble. God, I want to not trust in myself. God, I don't want to be trying to impress everybody else. That is a danger to myself. You guys, so many of us here are gardeners. You know, we talk about what we plant. What seed do you like? What about this and how does that work? Well, you know, just like I do, in the gardening world, there's all this talk about how to be self-sufficient. How to take care of yourself. How to be self-sufficient. And Zephaniah says, do not listen to them. Do not try to get your retirement to such a place that you don't ever have to look out and say, God, give me this day my daily bread. Because a godly prayer says, God, I'm putting myself in your hands. 
Do not try to get the kind of career where your boss or the company or even just you are sufficient. Pride has a, is a danger to all of us and humility is safety. I think as we walk through this, this is a call for us to learn to say, today I am not self-sufficient. I am not self-made. God, I am not the best. So I'm going to put myself in your hands. We are called to flee this statement of, I am the one and there is none besides me. Pride is a danger. I once had a customer who was an electrician at a Toyota manufacturing facility. They made Camrys and RAV4s and other things. And he was telling me what it was like to be an electrician in this facility because he said, there is this one place where all of the electricity flows through it. And it is marked off. It is locked off. There are signs. There are all sorts of things. He was like, but it is, we put on suits before we go into that place. But he's like, you would not believe how much power flows through that spot. Like if, if one thing goes wrong, and he said it has happened before, it will blow a man away or woman. It'll blow whoever is in that space away. There is so much power flowing through that. It is such a danger that even with all sorts of precautions, it is a terrifying place. It is a dangerous place. I was thinking of that place, that spot, because I think what Zephaniah is calling out to the nations and calling to you and I and says, pride has so much danger flowing through it. You have no idea you think that you can skirt through life with pride, that you can be driven by pride and somehow escape the consequences. And Zephaniah says, all of these terrible consequences come from this one root sin of pride. God says, I will destroy you and none will be left. This is a call for us to take seriously this warning and pursue humility. Because pride itself is at the root of so much of our anger, our bitterness. It's so much of our excusing ourselves is because we're proud and we're okay with it. And Zephaniah comes and says, no, it is a danger. Pursue humility. Put this off. Flee from this. Bow before the Lord who is the only one who can rightfully say, I am the one and there is none besides me. And so this is a call to you and I to look at ourselves this week and say, God, root out this sin of pride in me. I want the safety that comes from humility. Second way this passage calls us to bow before the Lord is to submit to His ways. What I want you to notice in this is the sin of Moab and Ammon. Now, Moab and Ammon, these are the descendants of Lot that Lot had when his daughters got him drunk and tricked him and got pregnant. Their whole story is this beginning of shame. And Moab's great great like legacy through the Bible, until we get to Ruth, but the great legacy of Moab and Ammon is that they are continually opposing the people of God. They don't want the people to pass through their land. They don't want to help them. They're continually opposing the people of God. They're not living in their land like the Philistines are but they're constantly opposing God's people. The blessing of God on Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 was whoever blesses you, I will bless, and whoever curses you, I will curse. Moab and Ammon are continually cursing God's people. And the great problem with what Moab and Ammon are doing is they are, they're not just, they're not simply making life difficult for Israel. They are hating the promises of God because they're hating the vessel of God. They are opposing the God who is working through the people of Israel. The great sin of Moab is not simply that they're annoying and making life difficult for somebody. It's they are saying, God, we will not love you by loving your promises and your ways. And so we're going to oppose your people. You promise to bless the world through them. We don't care. We don't want that way. We are going to, we're going to make life difficult And so this is a call for Moab and Ammon and for all of us to submit to God's ways and say, God, if you have said you're going to bless the world through Israel, then we're going to love Israel because that means we're loving you. I think this is this in this, it's a call to us that loving God's people is loving God's promises. We're loving the means that God is going to bless the world by loving Israel. And so it's a call to say, love Israel 
or I'm sorry, love God by loving his people. Love God by loving the way that he's going to use Israel to bless the world. And so Moab and Ammon are not submitting to God's ways of blessing the world because they're opposing Israel, which is the means of God's blessing to the world. That ultimately leads us to Christ because if you won't accept the way that God wants to rescue the world, then you're not accepting and bowing before the God who's going to save the world through Christ. You can't bow. In the Old Testament, they can't bow before God without bowing before His people. And now we can't bow before God without bowing before Christ. We can't bow before God without bowing before His ways. That if He says, this is the way, then we say, okay, God, we will accept it and love it because we're accepting you by doing that. In the Old Testament, it was by accepting and loving Israel. In the New Testament age, it's loving Israel. Christ, accepting Christ, believing the promises of Christ. And so if you're here today and you have been rebelling against God, you hear this talk of pride and you realize, I have blown it. I have set myself up, living my own way, doing my own thing. I have rejected and rebelled against God. That is the story of the Bible that says all of us are in sin. And the wages of sin is death. Physical death in this life and eternal death in hell forever. But Zephaniah points to the God who will rescue through his people Israel. And that points us to the, the, ultimately the true Israel, Christ, who satisfies God's anger towards our sin. When he lived the life we should live, died the death that we should die, and was raised to life. So that becomes ours as we submit to his ways in the gospel and say, I will trade with Jesus. I will stop trying to be the one I will stop trying to be self-sufficient, stop trying to run my own world, stop trying to be in control and sovereign. God, I will submit to you and I will accept Jesus. That is how the Bible says that we can be saved. That is the way that we start our life of submitting to his ways. It's by submitting to Jesus, the true Israel. So this passage calls us, calls the nations and calls us, in loving his people, we are submitting to God's ways because this is how he's determined to do it. And if we will not submit to his ways, then we aren't submitting to him. That can show up in the ways that we love God's people in the church. God, if this is how you've ordained it, if this is how you've planned for me to live my life as a Christian, then I am going to submit to you by loving your people. God, if you have called me to submit to you in your ways by putting off sin and trusting in Jesus, then I am going to do that. But it also looks like, I think, I, it looks like continuing to love the people Israel because God has said, I love Israel. I, I, I've said this before, but I can't believe in this age we have to again say that anti-Semitism has no place in the church. That if these are God's people, and if God says you're going to submit to be my loving my people, then in this age again, we have to say those who cannot love people whom we can see cannot love God whom we can't see. And so this passage says, will you submit to his ways by receiving Jesus and loving his people in the church and in Israel? Will you submit to God's ways and obey what he says, believing that his promises are going to come true? And then the third way we bow before the Lord from this passage is we worship the Lord. This is ultimately the sin that's behind all of these. In every one of these groups, when he calls out and says, Philistia, Moab, Ammon, Ethiopia, Assyria, when he says, this is the sin that's behind all of these sins, it's that you are worshiping and serving idols. The Lord will be awesome to them when he destroys all all the gods of the earth. Distant nations will bow down to him, all of them in their own lands. The ultimate sin that's behind all of the sins that calls, is, that calls all of the world, including America, to bow before him is will we bow before the Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts. Your translation may put that, the Lord of hosts. The, the Lord of heaven's armies, the Lord Almighty. He is the one that is, deserves all worship and He will destroy all other gods. And so, in this chapter, bowing means worship. And God says, will you come and worship? 
Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, is the, says that the, the call of God is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus repeats it in Matthew 22, verse 37. The greatest commandment is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We can easily lower the command of God in this. We can, this all means all in Deuteronomy 6 5 and Matthew 22 37. God wants worshipers who love Him more than anything else, more than their husband or their wife, more than their kids or their grandkids or their great grandkids, more than their reputation, more than their comfort, more than their security, more than their provision, more than feeling better. Do you love me? More than these, God says to us. What God wants from the nations, what He calls to the nations, is will you forsake all of these other things that you're bowing before? And will you come and love and worship Me? A pastor once said that he, uh, that a man had said, must I kiss my wife before bed? And he said, yes, but not that kind of must. He said, yes, not that kind of must. Should you love your wife? Yes. But it's got to come from the heart. It's not a command. Okay, let me just tow the line and do this a little bit. That What your marriage needs, this guy told the, the man, what your marriage needs is actually love from the heart. From the inside out. Not just, well, let, this is Israel's problem, is that Israel thought they could love all sorts of other things, but if they went to the temple and they gave enough sacrifices and they towed the line, then God would accept them. And God is like, no, what I want from you is a different kind of love that doesn't come from towing the line and following the rules, but it comes from a heart and soul and mind and strength that wouldn't be satisfied with something else. That's the kind of must that God requires from us. So the question from this passage is, do you worship? Do you bow? Do you love the Lord and worship the Lord more than anything else? Or is there something or many other things in your life that you prefer to Jesus? The question this passage asks us is, Is there anything that you love more? Do you keep God's standard? Do you bow before God alone? Do you treasure His promises? Or are you humble or are you full of pride and selfishness? The Lord is using this as a wake-up call for His people and for the nations. God declares His complete rejection of the proud, and this should lead all of us to throw ourselves down and say, God, have mercy on me. But where's the good news that God will give it? Where's the good news that God will give it? Philippians chapter 2 says that Jesus, though he was God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, humbled himself, and took the form of a servant, humbling himself to the point of the cross. Not simply as an example, but as a sacrifice. Jesus, the only humble man, died the death of the proud so that you can be given mercy. God's wrath was satisfied and turned away so that the nations who deserve only judgment can be forgiven and welcomed. This is so that the Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts can repent and be saved. This is so you can repent and be saved. Jesus turns God's wrath away from you because of your pride and selfishness. Don't you want to worship that kind of king? Don't you want to bow before the kind of king that would give himself for you while you are still a sinner? Do that today. Trust in that today. Submitting to yourself to the kind of king who would humble himself in your place. Receive his righteousness and walk in that. Bow before that awesome Lord before it's too late. I want you to imagine with me what would change for you this week if there was one person you bowed before, maybe you're a school teacher and you're going back to work this week, or a teacher's aide or a student, imagine what changes in the classroom 
when your worship has changed. There's one Lord that you're bowing before and not afraid of anybody. Not desperate for anything that anybody else could give you. Imagine what it would be like, whatever your job is. Maybe you're a farmer and you're watching the markets this week. Imagine what it's like this week to be free from the pride that says, I have to control this. I have to provide. Imagine what happens in your home. If your home was dominated by people pursuing humility, not pride, not selfishness, not clutching at self. Sounds like a good news kind of home. A home of humility. Imagine what changes in our church if we were known as a church of the humble who don't put ourselves first, but put each other first. A church is consumed with worship, not self. A church that says, God, if it's your way, we will do it even if it doesn't make sense. Imagine what changes in our church if our church was that kind of church. Imagine what changes in Manchester if the kids and families at the bus stop said, we get this idea, that's a humble church. It puts us first. Let's pray. God, the gospel shows us a God who would serve us before we deserve it. I pray that you would give us new hearts so that we can bow before you and transform our homes, our desires, and our town. In Jesus' name, amen.